we are now coming to one of the most important functions of the day that all of us have been looking forward to. That is the Silver Jubilee Oration by none other than Professor Balram. I am very pleased to say here that a few days ago when I called his office and I did some spying on his office on his date's availability, they told me that he was available today. And when I called him personally, he readily agreed to come and deliver this oration today. Now, Professor Balram, of course, does not need any introduction, is uh, what everyone would say, is the easiest thing to say. I have been a student in the molecular, molecular biophysics unit at IIC. He used to take the spectroscopy classes, which he used to actually deliver the lectures par excellence, if anything I can say. Now, those of you who have heard Professor Balram earlier, would agree with me that he is one of the best orators of our generation. In fact, he is one of the best communicators of our generation that we have seen till now. Those who have not heard him earlier will agree with me a few moments later. He did his uh, 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 part of studies in Pune in Ferguson College. And from there he went to IIT Kanpur as any other chemist uh, would do in the country. He did his PhD in the Carnegie Mellon and a brief one-year postdoc with Woodward Laboratory. He was appointed as assistant professor in ISC at the mere age of 24. Right? And ever since he has been in molecular biophysics units, his uh, synthetic chemist per se, his interest, long time interest has been peptide chemistry and protein design. And he has contributed enormously to this field over the last 30 and odd years or so. In fact, I may recall when we were students, we used to very eagerly look forward to the new peptide designs that he were doing when uh, taking his laboratory. And although we were not very comfortable approaching him directly, we used to be in constant conversation with his students on the new designs. And one particular design I remember that uh, at that time was those of two helices, and the helix induction would be by residues called AIB that probably he may talk about today. And the two helices were joined by proline and glycine, expecting to make an anti parallel double helix bundle sort of a thing. What turned out to be, instead of making two anti parallel helices, it actually became a single form helix with a kink in it. So, protein design has always been a great game and always has lots of surprises such as that that you have seen over a period of time. Professor Balram also, along with Professor Ramasation, several days ago, revived the fortunes of current science. And in fact, in the last uh, about 15 years or so, he has been the editor of current science. And most of us who subscribe to current science have subscribed it primarily for the reason that we always wanted to read his editorials. Right? So the first thing that the issue of current science comes in your hand, you immediately open the little issue and read what Professor Pandar has to say in that particular issue. I am reminded of the fact that when R.K. Lakshman did a talk in the Minister of Science Bank several years ago, Professor Sienna Rao introduced him, and at that time he said that we subscribe to Times of India only to read You Said It column, the You Said It cartoon of R.K. Lakshman. Very similarly, all of us actually subscribe to current science. Largely, it was of to read the eight minutes written by current science, the Professor Padra. Unfortunately, uh, about a month ago, he has stopped writing eight and he has handed over this responsibility to someone else. And we do hope that the level that he and Professor Ramsesha have brought the current science to will be even taken further by the new eight team. So, friends, it's a great pleasure to have Professor Padra with us here today. I invite him for his oration. So, to your oration.
like to thank uh, Dr. Shekhar Mande for inviting me to be with you this morning. And uh, also to say that the morning has been so full of reminiscence and uh, of events of the past 25 years that I must also begin with something on the same note. Uh, first of all, I was a student here in the Ferguson College in Pune many, many years ago, uh, pretty close to uh, mid, probably the mid-60s, so not yet uh, a little over 40 years ago. And uh, I have come back to Pune on many occasions, but the first time I came back after I came, returned to India and took up a job, was in 1978 when I came to the university. And I came to the university and spent five days at the university lecturing to the chemistry department on the new techniques of NMR, which had just become popular in India, and everybody was interested in listening to the determination of the structural molecules. Now I realized that I've come back to Pune many, many years later to talk about pretty much the same thing, except that I'm not going to talk about NMR, but I'm still going to talk about molecules and about the diversity of molecules in biology. The one way to celebrate an anniversary of a scientific institution would be, of course, with a scientific lecture. But I will try to avoid being completely technical. What I will do is to tell you a little bit about why I am talking about the subject, tell you a little bit about my own research interests, and then talk generally about the state of the field today. And I believe some of what I have to say will be of some interest to the new kind of institution that NCCS is trying to spawn off, which is, I don't know whether it is Yogi Shouts, uh, microbial culture collection or NCCS2 or whatever was mentioned in the morning. But when Dr. Shekhar Mande made his presentation, he showed a slide, which I rather like, which was the map of India, and then it showed all the places to which NCCS had exported cells. And he said that NCCS has served the country because so many people across the country can now use cell lines exported from NCCS. So I was sitting there wondering, what could I say about my own institution? The Indian Institute of Science, where I've spent the last 40 years, is one of India's oldest institutions. Uh, it celebrated 100 years, and now I think it's probably time not to celebrate anything for a while. And uh, I wondered what have we exported. And then I realized that what we've exported over the years are really organisms and not cells. <laughs> and we've exported whole organisms. Uh, we, and their diversity is quite remarkable. I saw three faces which I recognize. There are many more I know who have come from the Indian Institute of Science uh, on the recent staff. But I recognized uh, William Patole's uh, picture there as always absent. He uh, was a student in a course that I took uh, at the institute, and I remember him rather distinctly from then. Then there was Yogi Shauche, now uh, uh, respectably, uh, looks quite respectable nowadays. <laughs> And of course, your director, Shekhar Mande, who was also a student in our own department. Uh, so this is what institutions do. But if you look at the pictures of people, and if you look at the way they have developed over the years, and you look at the diversity of people that I've mentioned now, one is always wonders about the remarkable diversity in biology. Uh, there are two words in biology which are very common nowadays which were not used when I was young. I never heard the words mapping and mining in biology before. But over the last 20 years or so, after the genomics revolution, there are two words which biologists use. One of them is mapping. They map genes, they map genomes, and they mine. They mine information, they mine databases. Uh, uh, mining, of course, is a very bad word in Karnataka. Uh, the Supreme Court perpetually banning mining. So I've always wondered, what are we looking for? 
Biodiversity is another very common term nowadays. We are always protecting our biodiversity, often sometimes without knowing what we are protecting. So I thought that the title of my talk, this was an introduction to my title really, I gave the talk as chemical diversity in biology, which is effectively molecular diversity in biology, but one might start with molecular diversity in chemistry. And the way to do this is to go to the Chemical Abstracts website and ask how many substances do chemists know. Chemical Abstracts records all of them and they have a counter there. This is like the population counter which you will see at the ITO circle in Delhi which will tell you India's population, how it's changing. These are now molecules recorded into the Chemical Abstracts database. This was on the 24th of August. That was day before yesterday in the evening when I was trying to do this uh, along with a student of mine. And you can see within five minutes how it has changed. It's approximately 50 molecules added to chemical abstracts uh, every minute or so. So we counted 75 had got added in five minutes. So that's the rate of growth, except this was on a Saturday evening, uh, maybe a little bit more on, say, in the middle of the week, but I don't know for sure. But if you look at biochemistry, uh, this is what students see in biochemistry. Nowadays, of course, nobody studies biochemistry. Everybody studies something else. Uh, biotechnology, I guess. But, uh, biochemistry are these charts that you see. If the chemists have periodic tables on their walls, the biochemists have uh, this chart stuck on their wall. And the characteristic of this chart is that nobody ever reads it. The reason nobody ever reads it is that it's so complicated and there are molecules converted into other molecules by enzymes and this is the subject of intermediary metabolism which was forgotten quite some years ago. Today it's been revived. It's been revived by a new group and I'm sure that group will appear at NCCS which is the group which calls itself uh, Systems Biology. And uh, when you do systems biology, of course, you try to understand all these networks of molecules into converting into one another. When I look at cellular metabolic pathways and look at the chart, it reminds me, of course, of uh, the maps of cities that we have. But the interesting thing, if you look at the Bangalore city map, and this is true of Pune also, you will find that most of the roads are not marked. So the map actually looks much sparser than a metabolic uh, pathways map. But effectively, there are roads and avenues leading from one molecule to another, and this is really the rich diversity of chemistry that you see in biology. Now, I've been interested in biological molecules for a long time, and I tell you only one problem that we're doing as a kind of introduction to what I'm going to show you from the most recent literature. This is a study of molecules which are produced by the cone snail, which is the creature that you see uh, uh, over there. This is the cone snail, and the cone snail is an organism which doesn't move very fast, so in order for it to eat, it must immobilize its prey. So if it wants to immobilize a worm or fish so that it's paralyzed, can't move, and then it can engulf it, and it shoots it full of toxins. And these toxins are quite remarkable, and those are the molecules that we've been interested in for some time. All over the world, there are probably 500 species of cone snails, and the cone snails are a remarkable uh, set of organisms because they're evolutionally very, very old. And the older an organism is, the more evolved its chemistry is. And uh, they produce a remarkable variety of toxins, and most of these came to light in the 19, late 1980s and early 1990s in the work done by Professor Oliveira, first in the Philippines, and then later on, of course, he moved to the United States. He's at the University of Utah. And in keeping with the times, some years ago, he wrote a review in which he called this chronotoxin omics. The, the suffix omics, of course, must be added to any respectable field of modern biology. But another way of summarizing this is that there are many sna snails, there are many peptide toxins that they produce, and there are many enzymes which are present there. So there's a lot of work to be done. 
Now, I came to the chronotoxin problem uh, much later, 10 years after Oliveira had published much of his seminal work, and the problem came to me through Professor Krishnan, now at the National Center of Biological Sciences, whom you see here. And Krishnan appeared in my laboratory one day with all those snails, except he had them in a nice backpack, and came to my desk and turned the backpack over and put all the snails on my table. And there were extraordinarily many uh, creatures. Uh, they were all dead, but they were still smelling very bad. I asked him, what do you want me to do with this? He said, well, I want you to study them. They've got all kinds of molecules. You know something about molecules, so why don't you study them? I asked him, what will you do? He said, well, I'll go back to the seashore and collect more shells and come and give them to you, and you can study them. <laughs> and uh, these are his collaborators. And I didn't realize that we were on to a good collaboration. He did what he liked best, which was wandering around the seashore, uh, collecting shells. He kept the shells, and he gave me the ducks and venom ducks uh, uh, excised out, which were put into solvent, and from there my job was to extract molecules and characterize them. So I found this on the internet, uh, where Robert Louis Stevenson, the author of Treasure Island, says that it is perhaps a more fortunate destiny to have a taste for collecting shells than to be born a millionaire. Now, why do I use the word millionaire? The reason people are interested in the toxins which come from these uh, cold snakes, quite apart from the shells, is that these toxins target almost every receptor and channel in the central nervous system. And therefore, they are extraordinary tools for neurobiology, and they are also extraordinarily good uh, starting points for pharmaceutical drug discovery. And therefore, there's a great deal of interest. Of course, if you do find a very good molecule from this, you might, in fact, become a millionaire. But uh, even if you didn't become a millionaire, it's still a nice thing to do to collect the shares. What is there on this slide is still just a list of molecules which were being investigated some time earlier. One of them, the very first one, has in fact um, uh, gone, uh, is now in therapeutic use. But one of the interests which drives the pharmaceutical industry is the possibility of using these molecules as painkillers because they act on the receptors and channels at the synaptic junctions. And uh, if one can inhibit uh, the appropriate receptor or channel, then of course one has a starting point to develop the next generation of uh, uh, painkillers. This is the venom apparatus of the cone snail, a highly evolved apparatus where you have a bulb, a venom duct, in which the cells secrete the venom along this, and eventually a harpoon-like structure which is coated with the venom, which is now uh, uh, thrown off at the target, which would be a fish or a worm or another snail. But what you will get from this, of course, is if you uh, extract the venom duct, are the molecules which are there. And then what we do really is to look at the molecules which are produced by diverse cone snails. The technique that we use as the first line for structural elucidation is mass spectrometry. And today I won't explain to you what mass, spect mass spectrometry is, except to tell you that mass spectrometry is a remarkably simple technique because all it does is weigh molecules. And it labels every molecule with its mass, and if you break molecules, you will label the pieces with their mass, and therefore you can, in fact, using this technique, sequence molecules. You can sequence proteins, you can sequence peptides, and so forth. It's also a fantastically sensitive technique. You need very little material in order to use mass spectrometry. It's also got a very high resolution. The resolution in mass spectrometry has increased to the level that today you can measure masses of molecules to the third decimal place, which is the one thousandth of a Dalton. And if you remember your chemistry, you will remember that a hydrogen atom weighs one Dalton, and therefore you can make extraordinary distinctions between molecules. There's never been an analytical technique of this power, this sensitivity, and this resolution, which has been available to chemistry as has been in the last few years. And it is a rapidly evolving technique. So you can get these wonderful looking uh, mass spectra from which you can go ahead to characterize your molecules. So this is what my lab actually has been doing for the last few years, uh, trying to fractionate these crude venom samples into molecules. Once we've done that, we pick a molecule that we want to study, and then we go along to obtain spectra. I just show you this 
today is not the time to be technical, uh, today is probably the time to be sentimental. But you will see towards the second half of my talk uh, that uh, I will not be particularly sentimental, but I will be quite pragmatic uh, about the way ahead in the characterization of molecules from nature, which I believe everybody seems to want to do uh, in India today. The way molecules are, or peptides and proteins particularly, are studied by mass spectrometry is by fragmenting them in the gas phase. And since molecules are made up of uh, atoms connected by bonds, specific bonds fragment in the gas phase under mass spectral conditions, and therefore you can analyze spectra quite well. That's what we do and determine sequences. Once you determine sequences, occasionally you will run into problems, uh, technical problems like distinguishing between leucine and isoleucine, which are isomeric but have the same mass. So you will distinguish them then by doing other kinds of experiments which are now available. There are remarkable experiments which can be done in the gas phase today. Uh, gas phase experiments where electrons can be transferred individually to multiply charged molecules to do what is called electron transfer dissociation and from that kind of experiment then distinguish between say leucine and isoleucine. I will say one word in general about mass spectrometry because that's not the subject of my talk today. I have spoken about this at NCL some time ago in the proteomic symposium. Mass spectrometry now is not limited by mass. Uh, today, for example, an intact ribosome, where the mass can be measured in the gas phase. So the conventional view that biological molecules cannot be taken into the gas phase was removed a long time ago when John Fanning invented the technique of electrospray ionization. But today, electrospray ionization and nanospray methods have brought mass spectrometry to the condition that membrane protein complexes of very large complexity can in fact, in fact be taken into the gas phase and characterized with exquisite resolution. So this is what we really do. We try to determine sequences, uh, make these kinds of fine distinctions. But of course, once you have determined the sequence of something that you do not know, the question is how do you know you're correct? Uh, maybe you've made a mistake in the structure determination. So you can always occasionally check this out by synthesizing the molecule and comparing the synthetic product with the natural product and establishing a one-to-one -one identity, an old technique of chemistry. What does the coat fail and all other biological organisms, what do they produce? They produce complex mixtures of molecules which we can call libraries. These are natural libraries, and like a good librarian, what we need to be able to do is to catalog all the molecules uh, separately. And you can do this if you use, for example, mass as a criterion, some chemical property, in the case of the toxins, the number of disulfide bonds, and HP and C retention time. And you can do what is called deconvolution of a library. This deconvolution of a library is nothing but the job that a librarian does in a real library. He simply classifies the books, and they classify the book according to the subject, the author, and so forth. And one of the things that I might uh, remind you is, library classification owes a great deal to an old Indian librarian called Ranganathan, who worked at the Indian Institute of Science a very, very long time ago, and who introduced a classification system which was used in libraries when they were still uh, used. Uh, today, of course, nobody uses them. Uh, the search engine has uh, supplanted all classification. But there are other problems that one confronts. For example, all toxins, whether they are from snakes, spiders, uh, cone snails, or scorpions, they are rich in disulfide bonds. Many extracellular proteins are rich in disulfide bonds. For example, albumin, uh, which is the most abundant protein in your serum, uh, is very rich in disulfide bonds. It has 35 cysteine residues, 17 disulfide bonds, one free trial, and it is this molecule which carries uh, bilirubin uh, in the serum. If it doesn't do its job, of course, and you end up uh, getting liver disease. So all of these are intricately held by these disulfide bonds, but even if you have four systems, you will end up with three possibilities. If you have six, you will end up with three disulfide bonds and 15 possible ways of connecting them. If you go to ribonuclease, which has 
or lysozyme, which had eight cysteine residues and four disulfide bonds, you will end up with 105 possibilities. How do we distinguish between all these possibilities? You can again use mass spectrometry, and this is a method that we've developed over the last few years. You can, in fact, look at the chemical cleavages of cysteine in the gas phase and use that to try and determine the uh, connectivity of the disulfide bridges. I would just like to leave you as far as mass spectrometry is concerned with this cartoon. Mass spectrometry allows you to break molecules, proteins particularly, in the gas phase. The way biochemists do this in solution is to use proteases. You might ask yourself, what have molecular biologists used? Molecular biologists have traditionally used restriction endonucleases, for example, to cut nucleic acids. So if you cut molecules into pieces, you can then uh, sequence them much more easily. And, that, and in the gas phase, you can cut molecules, but you can cut them by breaking chemical bonds. So in a way, biochemistry has now been complemented there's by mass spectrometry techniques which allow you to do gas phase cleavages in addition to proteolytic cleavages in, in solution. If one has these molecules, of course, one can study the receptors against which they are targeted, and, uh, but that's not the subject of my talk today. What I want to really talk about is diversity. If you expect from the number of conus peptides expected from a single species, Originally, it was estimated by Oliveira about 10 years ago to be about 100. Today, that number has been revised upwards to almost about 1,000. But you can ask, what are the number of conus peptides you take from a single species? And this is by, uh, in a paper by Brian Chait at Rockefeller, uh, which is about 37. So the vast number, majority of molecules which are present in that venom, we haven't yet characterized. What is it that you would like to do when we use biodiversity, for example, when we use the word mapping and mining? Why do we want to map biodiversity sometimes? We want to map biodiversity because we believe that there is a rich molecular diversity which is present in all these biological species. We hope to be able to exploit these molecules. I would urge those of you who are students to just look at the advertisements put in the newspapers by the Department of Biotechnology. They spend a lot of money on those advertisements, and you can ask yourself the question, how many times do, do the word mining appear, and how many times does the word exploiting our bioresources appear? And what, how do we exploit our bioresources? We exploit our bioresources by actually mining them. We exploit our natural resources by mining them. But then we're looking for metals and minerals. What do we look for when we look at biological diversity? We're actually looking for molecules. We're looking for molecules in the hope that we will find pharmaceutically important molecules over there. Molecules which can then uh, be used in one way or the other. So there is a rather large shortfall in the way in which we can characterize molecules. This is largely because of the insensitivity and lack of resolution of offline purifications. It's also because of the imperfections of the chemical reactions that one has to do in the process of sequencing these materials. You have to reduce the sulfide bonds, alkylate the thiols, and so forth. All of this, you know, chemistry, when you do it in the laboratory, is never perfect. And if it isn't perfect and you're dealing with a large mixture, you uh, find analysis very difficult. I just digress for a moment to tell you where I learned chemical analysis first. I learned it in the chemistry laboratories, uh, BSc laboratories of the Ferguson College in Pune. What did they do in those days? Uh, what they did in the laboratory was they would mix two substances and hand it out to students, and students were supposed to separate them and find out what they were. We, of course, as students very quickly found out that the best way to find out what they was was to befriend the attender who actually mixed up those substances. <laughs> so you would find all the chemistry students particularly friendly with the attenders in the chemistry labs, uh, because they would then get the answer before they went in. All you needed to know was a little bit of theory so that you could write down the right reactions in your record book, even if you hadn't actually carried them out. 
Now you can see that if I mixed up 10 different substances and gave it, uh, the students would never be able to do it. If I mixed 100 substances, they'd never be able to do it. And here the cold stage mixing 1,000 substances and uh, handing it out uh, to the chemist, asking him, okay, find out what I've mixed together. And now you can't befriend the cold snail and get an answer. So the next best thing to do is to turn to molecular biology. And uh, there is this new technique of next generation sequencing, uh, which has appeared. And this is a wonderful technique. Uh, all you have to do now is to isolate mRNA from the venom duct and uh, uh, assume that uh, all this mRNA you can now convert into cDNA. And then you get a cDNA like thing. And once you've got the cDNA like it, you just break it up. You just chop it into nucleotide pieces, and you have this mixture of millions of nucleotides. And once you have this mixture of millions of nucleotides, you just sequence all of them. And once you've sequenced all of them, you've got these million sequences, and you need now to assemble them together. This is, where, this is what I like about this method, because everything that is to be done up to this point uh, can be done by a company. Everything that is to be done after this point, someone else has to do. And that someone else, when you assemble these sequences together, of course now requires computer scientists to be able to write programs, which are called assemblers, which will then try to make sense of all these uh, patterns. So when we got interested in this, I thought that this, uh, actually I should say, I must confess here, uh, just the way Professor Mr. said quite correctly that he did nothing, because I know he did nothing. Uh, everything was done by Dr. Wag. But I was just building it up. Because both you and I don't know anything about buildings. I also built a lot of buildings without knowing anything about them. The, uh, were actually all done by Professor Krishnan, who had this idea that here was a new method which could somehow be used. And uh, the wonderful thing about Professor Krishnan, my collaborator, is that he's hugely enthusiastic and believes that every new method which appears in the literature has actually been invented just to solve the problem in which you're working. <laughs> and uh, so he said, this must be meant uh, for this problem, so let's uh, get on with this. So we sent off a sample of uh, uh, DNA which we prepared after some difficulty to Barcelona to get uh, these so-called cDNA reads. Effectively, what comes from Barcelona is now uh, about 10 million sequences. Now, these 10 million sequences we shopped around, and we finally found one uh, uh, friendly uh, uh, computer scientist who knew a little bit about this, who helped us to work with these assembler programs, which allow these to be put together. And then from this, you would get 270,000 amino acid sequences. Now, of course, most of these sequences are nonsense. Uh, you, because you have to translate the nucleotide sequence into all six reading frames. And if you translate them into all six reading frames, you get a lot of sequences. But now you can use some other kinds of criteria. You have to remove all the trash. And once you remove all the trash, you need to worry a little bit about the kind of post-translation modifications which might be there, and then try to identify mature toxins. In the case of the chronotoxins, this becomes somewhat easy. Because what we are looking for are cysteine rate sequences. We know what their rough length should be, so you can apply sequence criteria, length criteria, to actually filter down the number of possibilities. So eventually, one can use the kind of motifs which are currently available in the chronotoxin databases, a maximum and minimum length criterion, so that this, you get many, many stop signals along the way, so that you can discard all of those, and eventually generate probable mature toxin sequences, generate all possible post-translational modifications, because we know what kinds of post-translational modifications can be made in chronotoxins, at least what have been identified so far, and eventually couple this with mass spectrometry or the, di or the venom directly to try and identify sequences. Because our problem was that we were unable to sequence all the peptides directly by mass spectrometry and you need some kind of uh, help from sequence information. We have done this and therefore one can take uh, the venom 
get all those nice looking mass spectra, use the kind of methodology that I showed you with some understanding of the biosynthesis of the protoxins, put all of this data together, I won't worry you too much about the interpretation of all of this, and eventually we suddenly found that we can sequence a large, uh, we can get many, many more toxin sequences from the venom because we are now being aided by the knowledge that we have from next generation sequencing data. In a way, this is a kind of proteomic approach, except there is no genome sequence for the cold state, so we cannot now use translated genome sequences. So we are trying to use next generation sequencing data here. So we can now assign a very much larger number of sequences and uh, eventually try and speculate of what their biological activities would be, hope to do experiments to determine their biological activities and so on. Now what I will do is I will switch gears at this point to tell you a little bit about why I wanted to talk about chemical diversity in biology. And uh, at this point, I would request uh, Yogesh to wake up and pay attention. <laughs> I'll tell you the reason for this also. The reason for this is that the Department of Biotechnology, I think right through the days of Dr. Wag till today, has never stopped creating new institutions. And uh, whenever they want to create new institutions, first they will create a project. They will create a large project, a project that looks like it has no end in sight, and therefore if a project has no end in sight, then the best thing to do is to create an institution to carry out the project. And uh, eventually this will magnify into something else. Now there is this project which I think Yogesh and uh, a whole lot of other people from labs across the country, uh, the CSIR, uh, DBT, uh, everyone except uh, the Indian Institute of Science is involved in this project, uh, is to look at uh, molecules from microorganisms and hope that these molecules will have uh, one of three activities, anti-cancer, uh, anti-infective, or anti-diabetic activity. Now, of course, when large sums of money are invested by the government in these projects, uh, they need some people who will certify that these projects are going along well and I have been elected to be that person. So I'm the chairman of the committee which periodically reviews Yogesh's project. I always say he's doing wonderfully well. <laughs> and, uh, but I am sometimes alarmed at the fact that in India, we are in fact underestimating the scientific complexity of uh, the problems that are involved. And that is what I would really like to address in the remaining portion of my presentation. Now let's go and look at natural products. I was a student of chemistry. When I was a student of chemistry, uh, there were three natural products. Uh, there were actually two natural products that we were taught in class, uh, alkaloids and terpenes. And all of these came from plant sources because chemists at that time had not yet discovered microbiology. And uh, so I have project, uh, the, the kinds of molecules that have become popular over the years, strychnine, cholesterol, uh, erythromycin, for example, which uh, uh, comes from a microbial source. Uh, these are the kinds of molecules that everybody knows about. Now, of course, if you go to a microbial source, and I show you just one example from a visitor in my laboratory. I get a large number of visitors in my laboratory who come with extracts. And all of them come with extracts with one idea, that is to characterize the molecules of them. They always tell me we don't have the facilities to do it. I said, what facility do you need? They said, look, we don't have LCMS. I said, oh, fine, you don't have LCMS, I'll give you an LCMS and you can go away and find the molecule. They will say, no, you have to find the molecules for us. I said, very difficult to find molecules like this because that means you have to uh, worry about the spectra and think about it and finding new molecules is much more difficult than finding old molecules. Here's an example of finding old molecules for the student from Gujarat, uh, who came to my lab with the culture of Bacillus subtilis. Uh, she said it's a banyan endophyte, uh, it's a new species, and these are the molecules that this actually produces. But if you take an extract and look at an HPLC, this is what the HPLC would look like. And uh, you can classify all the molecules because other people have done this before. Uh, Fengicins, surfactins, eturins, a whole lot of lipopeptides. 
And all of these are somewhat difficult molecules as far as their structures are concerned. Their chemical complexity is quite large. If you take a single HPLC peak, like the one which I show you there, and if you put it onto a body mass spectrometer, you will find that that single HPLC peak has got a huge number of molecules in it because of microheterogeneity. These are all products of non-ribosomal synthesis. And in non-ribosomal synthesis of polypeptides, uh, there are many, many more mistakes, or not mistakes, I think this is one way of biology generating diversity, probably done intentionally. So these are the kinds of molecules which are present. And if you look at the chemical structures, you will find that the chemical structures are uh, reasonably complex. Now the other kinds of molecules which many of you will be familiar with, which are derived by non-ribosomal pe peptide synthesis, vancomycin is a very good example. Today this is the last line antibiotic uh, after uh, patients have become resistant to other antibiotics. Uh, polymixin, which is rarely used, but uh, still useful sometimes. Uh, uh, septic shock, for instance, uh, polymixins uh, still might be used. And the non-ribosomal peptide synthesis is actually carried out by multimodular enzyme complexes which put them together. And I refer you to an article in Nature which appeared as lessons from natural molecules, which anybody who's interested in the developing chemistry of natural products they should actually look at because this tells you how complexity is developing by non-ribosomal synthesis. But the reason I draw your attention to this is that what I'm going to do over the next few slides is to revisit really the chemistry of natural products. What are natural products? Natural products are everything that you have in biology. Unfortunately, what's happened is they're classified into primary metabolites and secondary metabolites. Primary metabolites are those that you find in the biochemistry textbook. Uh, secondary metabolites are those you find elsewhere. And those are, you know, organisms invest a great deal of uh, energy, uh, genetic information in actually producing secondary metabolites. I found many years ago this wonderful quotation in Advances in Applied Microbiology where Bennett and Bentley wrote that secondary metabolism represents the splendid idiosyncratic diversity of nature in downing different species with specific solutions to biological problems. And there isn't a better definition of secondary metabolites anywhere. It is wonderful. There's, these are molecules which are produced by organisms, the organisms which I think Yogesh will now have in large numbers uh, in this new facility. They're all producing them, and they produce them for a purpose. What is that purpose? That is a biological question. Can those molecules be used for some other purpose by us? That's another question. That's a chemical and pharmaceutical question. These are what one would like to answer. Activity-guided fractionation of natural extracts. That's what everybody would like to do. People appear with formulations which are used somewhere or the other for one pharmaceutical purpose or the other and say, let's now get a new molecule from it so that we can get a patent. But the one thing that I would like to mention, especially for the students, when I was a student, there's one word which I never knew. That was the word intellectual property. Today, everybody talks about intellectual property and protecting it. I will remind you that if in order to generate intellectual property, first of all, the intellect has to be applied. And therefore, applying the intellect is probably the most important thing that one needs to do in research. But by now you will have read my slide. Crude extract to pure biologically active substance. This is how everything from the vitamins to the antibiotics has been found in the century that has passed. Chromatography is of course involved. However sophisticated it becomes, chromatography is boring, laborious, and needs patience and skill. I found this in A.J.P. Martin's Nobel Lecture. A.J.P. Martin got the Nobel Prize along with Singe. They developed tin layer chromatography and paper chromatography in those days. I went and read his Nobel Lecture when I was asked to give a seminar in a college in Bangalore on chromatography. They were having a workshop and they said someone has to come and give the opening lecture on chromatography. I asked the people who came to invite me, why are you calling me? Uh, they said, uh, 
I don't know very much about chromatography. They said that we've gone to your colleagues uh, uh, who are who we know who know more about chromatography, but they've all said they're too busy, so we've come to you. They asked them, I don't know very much about it, but uh, how do you expect them? They said, well, sir, it doesn't matter. Uh, you will speak anyway, so you can come along. And you can read about it and come and tell us. So I went along and read about it, and then I found what I call Martin's Principle. Nothing is too difficult as long as someone else does it. So if the students who do the chromatography, and eventually you can in fact flush state substances. But now I will come to what I think is the most important message that I want to convey to you today. Uh, this is an article which has just appeared, uh, and I will read the title to you. It says, ribosomally synthesized and post-translationally modified peptide natural products, overview and recommendations for a universal nomenclature. Why am I showing you this? I'm showing you this because when I first saw this article, the only thing that I was impressed was my complete and total ignorance of everything that was there in this article. And this really shocked me. There are 65 authors in this, and since there are 65 authors, I guess this must be an important subject. And therefore, the only two subjects in which I know that the number of authors exceeds 50. One is genomics, and the other is particle physics. These are the only two subjects, and now I think natural products, which is right there in the title, it has 65 authors, and they're all very, very well-known authors all across the world. Uh, and what they have now tried to put together are the number of peptide natural products which are synthesized, genetically encoded, ribosomally synthesized, and post-translationally modified. Now the post-translational modifications that happen here are not the post-translational modifications that the students will study in a biochemistry course. Not phosphorylation, acetylation, not all of those things. These are completely different post-translational modifications, complex. And I will show you what they are. Here, for example, is a peptide called Satyrosin. This belongs to a class called Sati peptides, which are actually produced. But if you look at the structures a little bit carefully, you will see that the linkage here is not the disulfide bond, but it is a thioether. One sulfur is missing. But what is the cysteine residue connected to? The cysteine residue is connected to the alpha carbon atom of another amino acid. So this is a completely different linkage, and there are three of them in this molecule. But there is a gene for this molecule. The gene is now expressed, the mRNA is translated, you get a precursor polypeptide just like the conocoxins, which is then post-translationally processed in order to get this. But in non-ribosomal synthesis, you can in fact see this in non-ribosomal synthesis natural products. But all of these kinds of peptides, all of these are ribosomally synthesized now. They are not bacterial products which are the products of non-ribosomal synthesis. They are ribosomal synthesis, nanopeptides, molecules like this. You can just look at the structural diversity here. And I wanted to show you just one. I'll take this example a little bit. Look at these structures here. You can find heterocyclic rings, five member rings with nitrogen and oxygen. Where do they come from? Here is a molecule called microsin, rhodesporin, and plantasiracin. This is a DNA guidance inhibitor. This induces secondary metabolism and morphogenesis, uh, development, uh, differentiation, all of that in actinomyces. This is a selective antibiotic with an unknown target. Nobody knows. But we'll look at these molecules a little bit carefully, and we will see all these odd structures there. How is this molecule produced? These molecules are now produced from these precursor proteins, which have an amino acid sequence just like the proteins of classical biochemistry. These are the precursor proteins, but what happens is that there is an enzyme complex, actually three proteins complex together, and C and D together are a cyclodehydratase, which takes cysteine and serine or threonine and backbone dehydration with the preceding amino acid to generate these structures. You lose 18 Daltons in mass, so you can detect it by spectrometry here. And then there is another third enzyme, 
which is an FMA independent dehydrogenase, which is a complex here, yeah, which does this dehydrogenation. So you get deoxazoles, the metal oxazoles, if you use selenium or threonine in the original seed. But I want to draw your attention to this molecule here, streptolysin S. Streptolysin S has this precursor which has been in the last few years sequenced. But you might ask yourself the question, what is streptolysin X? So when I was reading this article, and this was just a few days ago, after I had given Shekhar uh, the title of my talk, I was reading this and then I found, what is streptolysin S and why isn't the structure of streptolysin S uh, on that figure they have in the review? Because if it's the first molecule, how is it there in the next figure, but not in the previous figure? So I'll show you the next slide. This is, of course, clandestine, which will come from a precursor peptide, looking, which has a sequence like this, but it will translate into that. So it is remarkable post-translational modification. Coming back to streptolysin S. In 1901, more than 100 years ago, it was found that pathogenic streptococci separate and secrete a beta hemolytic factor. This was known as the beta hemolytic factor. In fact, the beta hemolytic phenotype itself uh, came at around this time. But nothing was known about streptolysin, although it is very widely studied in the 1930s and still appears in the medical literature today. There have been a number of genetic and biochemical studies in the first decade of the century, you know, five, eight, nine. But what I want to tell you is that the precursor molecule is known, but the chemical structure of this 2.7 kilodalton peptide is still unknown. It's unknown today. I say this because many times people who come wanting to characterize molecules from extracts believe that the task of structure determination is a trivial task. It, it is not a trivial task, it's a very complex task, and sometimes you don't know the ways in which nature can actually cheat you and fool you in the kinds of reactions it's able to do. But while I was reading this, I thought, I found another example which I thought was rather interesting. The cyclic dipeptides, dichetopiprazines or dioxopiprazines, are very common molecules. In fact, it turns out that in the project that uh, Dr. Schultz has been involved in, very frequently I find that the structures of dichetopiprazines, for example, are shown. These are new molecules. They are old molecules. They surface again in the bacterial extract. Look at this. This is a molecule which is derived from there, and it turns out that there is a gene in this species of streptomyces which actually carries out a reaction which converts this into this. So there are proteins now, enzymes which do this. There is a second group, in fact, which we will now find make these cyclopeptidoxines, which are called cyclodipeptide synthases, which have now been found. These are now a family of enzymes which depend on tRNA. They look like the tRNA synthetases, they bind tRNA, but what they do is they bind tRNA, take the amino acid from the tRNA, take two amino acids and join them together to get the dichetoprotosomes. This, for example, is a cyclodiphytosine synthetase from mycobacterium tuberculosis. Shekhar would might recognize this. This has a gene product from RB2275. This is a diphytosine synthase, which actually used tyrosine tRNA synthetase. Now, if you look at the crystal structure of this molecule from MTB, you can see the remarkable similarity that it has to the tyrosine tRNA synthetase from uh, methanococcus yanaki. So, it is in fact not doing what you might expect it to do, but doing something else. Here, for example, is one from Bacillus. This now actually produces this molecule, which is now being quite widely investigated, because the dichetopeprazines have very, very promising activity in the anti-cancer field, and there's a great deal of medicinal chemistry uh, which goes on uh, on this. But as far as natural products are concerned, what I wanted to leave with you is that 
you might have genes which now get translated into proteins, but these proteins now get processed in remarkable ways which you are unaware of to give you new molecules which are in fact post-translationally modified, but they are post-translationally modified products of ribosomal synthesis. Now those of you uh, who are students might ask the question, why was all of this not found out before? The reason why all of this was not found out before was that we lacked the techniques to find this. Natural products chemistry was a very rich field uh, in India. Dr. Ganesh who is here will testify to the amount of activity which used to go on maybe 50 years ago in the Delhi University Chemistry Department. But natural products chemistry today in India is an extinct field. It is an extinct field because the techniques for studying natural products have come only recently. And the most sophisticated techniques are available today, but we do not have the chemists who can in fact study them. What can natural products be? Look at this discovery, for example, of the Chinese scientist Yu Yu Tu, who discovered artemisinin. And a, few, a couple of years ago, when she was given the last award, you can see the structure of artemisinin. But you can see what was the trick in her, in success. The Chinese were screening a large number of plant products for anti-malarial activity during the Cultural Revolution. Somebody mentioned in the morning, Cultural Revolution. Actually, at the time when the Cultural Revolution took place in China, they sent all the scientists to the fields. Uh, those scientists who were not sent to the fields were asked to work on a project, on a directed project, not the project in which everybody did whatever they liked. And uh, on the directed project, of course, with Chairman Mao looking over their shoulder, uh, what they had to do was uh, uh, find an antimalaria. So they screened thousands and thousands of extracts by injecting them into malaria-infected mice. They used the mice model directly and to see whether there was parasite clearance. And then they found that there was parasite clearance with this one extract which looked quite promising, and they tried to isolate the molecule. But when this is an extraordinarily reactive skeleton, you can see a peroxide there, and even those of you who don't like uh, uh, chemistry will know that uh, many of the alkyl peroxides are actually explosive. Therefore, heating this molecule, molecule will just explode and uh, lose its structure altogether. Okay. Uh, not only bacteria, plants, uh, have so many molecules. If you look at this paper which appeared in science, which, uh, which classifies uh, uh, a lot of uh, plant drugs of economic value, I put these references from science and nature because uh, one thing that I've noticed in uh, uh, Indian biology over the last several years is that very few people like to read the articles and anything else. So they believe that if something appears in science and nature, it must be important. So if you want to draw their attention to an old and unfashionable area like the chemistry of natural products, uh, there is no better way to do it uh, than to tell them that papers have in fact appeared in this area in science and nature and everyone's looking at them. But this paper has something rather interesting. Uh, it doesn't have this figure. I made this figure by taking all the names and uh, uh, going to Google Images and pulling uh, uh, structures out and pasting them together. But uh, you can see all the wonderful molecules which have come from plants. Okay. Look at the last one. Here's one which has come from plants quite recently. Commodity. And why is it important? You will see this paper here now in Nature Chemistry which appeared in 2011. This is now a non-opioid analgesic. And one of the uh, great advantages of this appears to be, at least in animal models, is that it appears to be non-addictive as compared to morphine, which is the traditional uh, opioid analgesic. So there are still a very large number of things uh, to be uh, investigated, even in plant natural products. Now you might ask, how do plants now produce this diversity? The way plants appear to produce this diversity is slightly different. Here what happens is a large amount of the reactions which are done are enzymatically done, and the enzymes produced which actually make these molecules are now promiscuous as far as their substrates are concerned. They're quite relaxed as far. They look more like the non-ribosomal synthesis uh, enzymes of uh, microorganisms. So there is a great amount of uh, 
a unity in biology when you look at it uh, at the underlying chemistry. But if you have promiscuous enzymes, then you can take many different substrates and produce many different products. Today, when people talk about metabolic engineering, this is really what they're talking about. What they would really like to do is to engineer microorganisms to take the substrates that you want to produce the molecules that you so desire. But I will conclude now by going back and telling you how analytical methodology has actually improved. This is the original experiment done by Stanley Miller many years ago, when he passed a spark discharge to a mixture of gases, methane, ammonia, hydrogen, and water, and produced the amino acids. And therefore, origins of life could be traced back to all kinds of uh, non-biological uh, activities uh, which happened at that time. But if you go back and take Miller's samples, and this was done in a paper in Science in 2008, and look at it with electrospray ionization mass spectrometry coupled to liquid chromatography, you would find that instead of the few spots which uh, Miller first detected in Chicago, uh, these are the few spots that he detected, you can now detect very many more molecules there. This is simply because over 50 years, our abilities for detecting molecules has vastly improved. If you go to meteorites, for example, like the Murchison meteorite 40 years after it has fallen, today you will find, at least, at last count in 2010, there are at least 14,200 distinct molecular formulas which are actually present in the material on the meteorite. This, of course, is of interest to people who are looking at extraterrestrial origins for the molecules that you find uh, on Earth. But this very last uh, slide uh, example which I will show you is something that I saw uh, a few weeks ago in science uh, which deals with uh, this kind of uh, uh, sort of beetle which you find uh, everywhere. Uh, this was introduced from Asia into the United States and it turns out that this was introduced because it has molecules which now act against staphylis, uh, pests, and uh, unfortunately what this does also is it kills off all the native beetles also because it produces something which is toxic to them. The molecule has now been found uh, and this is this molecule harmony which you can see is an extraordinarily simple alkaloid. It has two nitrogen atoms and this long chain. This same molecule has been shown to have anti-mycobacterial and anti activity. But the way this molecule is produced, the reason why the organism produces this molecule is really in order to survive and uh, in order to survive in a particular environment. And uh, one can in fact maybe uh, tune these molecules, uh, tune these organisms to produce variants of these molecules also. So there is a field which is developing very rapidly now, which is the field of chemical ecology. And this field is what Thomas Eisner some years ago in uh, a special issue of the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences described as the product of a partnership between biologists and natural products chemists, united by a shared vision and empowered by complementary skills. I like this very much because the phrase that he uses, shared vision and complementary skills, are really most important for the kind of research that one would like to do in the areas of uh, mining and mapping of biological and chemical diversity for useful purposes. He adds that the vision stems from the realization that all organisms emit chemical signals and that all in their respective ways respond to the chemical emissions of others. He concludes Chemical ecology is now embarking on the most ambitious and inventive phase of its existence. To stand by and allow natural products chemistry to vanish or even to be weakened is to deny chemical ecology its future. What I think we should be looking at in India is really to begin to strengthen once again the areas of chemistry which deal with the chemistry of natural products so that we can in fact take advantage of this enormous advance that has taken place in analytical chemistry and the enormous advances that have taken place in biology over the last uh, two or three decades. 
I was trained as a chemist. I have always been in a department which was in a biology division of the institute. Over the last so many years, I have found that if you work in areas which neither like here nor there, then it usually turns out that the chemists say that you're not a chemist and the biologists say that you're not a biologist. <laughs> of course, I go everywhere and say that if you want to learn biology, there are only three things that you must appreciate. The rest of it you can actually learn. And this is really for the students. Sometimes I find biologists themselves do not appreciate the foundations of their disciplines. Biology today, modern biology, genomics, proteomics, all those terrible omics that everybody talks about, <laughs> really derive and rest on three pillars. Of these three pillars, two were erected in the 19th century. One was erected in the 20th century. Natural selection lies behind everything that I've told you. Inheritance, of course, is the key. Uh, genes, mutations, over generations, mutations in response to environment, selection, and of course the chemistry of heredity, which is really the base pairing schemes which uh, Watson and Trick put up after Avery had uh, discovered that DNA was the genetic material. And it's really the spelling that you use even in deciphering uh, the sequence information that you have embedded in all those uh, sequences that you determine with modern technologies. There is, I believe, in the kind of uh, chemistry that I have described, a great deal more to be found. And I hope that uh, in institutions like NCCS in collaboration with all the other institutions in, in the surroundings, that you will one day also develop, I think, what Eisner called a shared vision empowered by complementary skills in order to take these problems forward. Thank you very much once again for the